I'm Dan Rundy. Uh, I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. I'm a Senior Vice President. We're going to be ha this is the U.S. launch of the World Migration Report 2020. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, that we've got Mari McAuliffe, who's the head of Migration Policy Research at IOM, who's going to present the findings, and then we've got a really interesting panel. Um, who's uh, Michael Clemens. I'm in the school of Michael Clemens at the Center for Global Development. Uh, the magic number is 8,000. When a country hits $8,000 per capita, people stop migrating. That's a little bit of simplistic, and you guys can kind of quibble with me, but masa menos. And so I think, you know, he'll, I think he'll talk about that, and he's the one who kind of did the initial research at CGD, and I'm really glad he's going to be with us. Um, we also have... Um, uh, my friend, who is at the co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute, Kathleen Newland, um, who you know, these are all folks who've been working on these issues for a really long time. Uh, CSIS <laughs> did a report uh, a couple years ago in 2018 uh, that I led uh, called uh, "Confronting the Global Forced Migration Crisis." Um, I, what I wanted to do was have a bipartisan task force. I wanted to have it lean Republican. Um, so that we could have a, a conversation in Washington at a time when we needed more Republicans to be talking about this. Um, we did several things. I mean, one of them was the, my big takeaway from it. I had several deep thoughts that I, that I took away from it. Um, and I think maybe we'll have a chance to debate or discuss some of that. Um, we took on and made some estimates that I think the report, you know, doesn't necessarily agree with. But, I mean, if you look at sort of migration and you look at just all the, a lot of the troubles in the world, if we do nothing, if we do nothing, um, there's going to be a lot more forced migrants, and we can have a discussion. What does forced migrants mean, and what is the definition of that? And there's lots of touchy definitional issues in this world. Um, but I just say that uh, my argument is, is like, if we do nothing, it's going to be a lot bigger. And I think the report may or may not agree with that, and maybe we can kind of unpack that and discuss that. The other couple of things I thought were pretty interesting is if you look at all the foreign aid, as you, if, at least this is a couple years old, if you looked at it as a percentage of all the pie of foreign aid being spent in the world, something like 12% of all foreign aid was just kind of dealing with, if, if I'm a refugee and I showed up in Sweden, just housing and teaching the, the refugee Swedish was now 12% of all foreign aid. There was a huge jump in that. And then if you looked at the f spending of um, forced migration compared to global health. Global health is kind of the 800 pound gorilla in foreign aid in terms of like the pie. And if you look at the amount of money being spent on forced migration compared to global health, there's going to come a time soon, I would posit, when those lines are going to cross and there's going to be more money spent just playing defense on answering the mail on forced migration than what we're spending on global health. Now, we can quibble with it, and you guys can, you know, you know, we did some, we did some of these numbers ourselves, and the estimates on displacement scenarios. We just said, okay, we, we had a couple of kind of thumbnail issues, and like I said, we can quibble about that, and I'm, I'm hoping we can unpack what it's going to look like. But I would argue, if we do nothing, if we're going to have, we're going to have a doubling of people in Africa, we're going to go from one billion people to two billion people, and I think it's great. It could be, you know, a huge opportunity if it's managed properly. But young people have four options with their energy. They're either going to take a job, they're going to go to school, they're going to use their energy, whether it's in the United States or Central America or Africa or anyplace else, for something non-constructive, that's a think tank term for things like gangs or militias or badness, or they're going to migrate. That's my view. That's Dan's typology of what young people do with their energy. So my preference is door number one and door number two. So you now we can talk about the benefits of migration and managing it, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we can have that conversation. But I prefer door number one and door number two. And if you look at all the aid agencies in Europe, if you look, and I had some of our folks go look at every single aid agency strategic plan, and their top three issues is dealing with forced migration today, uh, in, particularly in Africa. This is a demographic tsunami that's coming, and it's front and center, and it's impacting electorates. It's changing. Look at look at Germany, and you want to tell me like what's happening there? I could we I think we could look at you look at Brexit. I think we can think of some other countries where I think migration is a salient issue. So I do hope we're also going to have a chance in this conversation to like let's have a real conversation about some of the challenges of this because I think that this is moving voters, 
And I would argue that our border's gonna be harder or border's gonna be softer in the next 10 years in OECD countries, I would argue that borders are likely gonna be harder. So uh, with all of that said, I think I'm really pleased to have Mari come up here and present the findings and then we'll have a conversation with some really thoughtful discussions. Mari, come on up. Thanks so much. Thank you so much indeed, Dan, for that welcome. And I really would like to say thank you to a number of different people, the Danish Embassy for hosting this event, to CIS, CSIS, CSIS for having the launch of the World Migration Report in these wonderful premises in downtown DC. Also to USA for IOM and my colleagues at the IOM office in DC who've been wonderful and have been very supportive in terms of both the programming and the support for the World Migration Report. I'm also very pleased and feel very privileged to be talking to you all today. Thank you for giving up your precious time. This is uh, meaningful anywhere in the world, but it's particularly meaningful here in this place at this time. So thank you very much for coming. What we'll do is we will go through well, it's a 530-page report, so I'm giving you a taster. I'm going to go through page by page by page. No, I'm not going to go through page by page by page. I am going to give you a taster, and I would encourage you to dip into the report. It is a reference report, and I will unashamedly acknowledge that only two people in the world read the entire thing. That's me and my production manager, Valerie Hager, who is a god to me because we go through and we read the entire report. We make sure that the QA is there. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It's not just what is produced, it's also how it's produced. It's a highly collaborative venture with a number of partners from all around the world. So let's get into the presentation. I will be looking for the clicker, which I haven't got. Ah, thanks, Chris. Thank you so much, Indy. OK, I'll go that way. Let's see. We'll give it a run. Good. This is just very quickly the presentation outline. As I said, we'll try and keep to 15 minutes. I do need someone to red, ca red card me. I don't know who, you can all do that after 15 minutes because I do tend to talk quite a lot. Well, yeah, okay, we'll cut it, great, fantastic. But uh, we just want to look at not just what is produced and what the findings are, but how it's done because that's particularly important in this day and age, as we know. A little bit about IOM and how the report is situated within the broader context of IOM, including historically. What I've highlighted there is just in bold that we are advancing an evidence-based understanding of migration issues globally. But of course, many people know IOM as an operational agency because of our deep history in supporting displaced persons to find new lives in different countries and in different parts of the world. That is still, unfortunately, the main part of our work. I wish it wasn't the case because that would mean that the problems have been solved, but unfortunately we're seeing a growing issue in terms of internal displacement and cross-border displacement. I just wanted to really highlight the text at the bottom there. It's a lovely map, I know, but at the bottom we can really talk about 67 member states of IOM in 1998 now 173, about to be 174 globally. And then our offices around the world have gone from 120 in 1998 to 436, and that was as at October last year. Again, some may say that's because we do wonderful work, and I will take that compliment, but it is a reflection of the issues around vulnerability in migration. It's the issues around displacement, both internally, IOM does a lot of work on internal displacement, as well as cross-border displacement in relation to conflict and violence, but also in relation to hazards, weather-related events. So that's a little bit about IOM. Now, I'm not gonna read that out. This is from our Director General, Antonio Vitorino, and it really illustrates, if you wanna take two sentences, why do we do this? This is why we produce the report. It's always been important. The first World Migration Report was produced in 2000. We do it every two years, roughly. But it's more important than it has been at any other time for those unfortunate reasons highlighted by our Director General. This is the World Migration Report 2020, the table of contents. We know that readers and we know that Valerie and I are the only ones that read the entire thing, so we know that readers need to dip in and dip out of a reference report. 
We have published in English, Spanish and French, those are our official languages of IOM, all of the chapters separately. So they're all able to be downloaded. If you are working on human mobility and environmental change and displacement, then you can just download that chapter. If you are teaching at a university and you want your students to understand the fundamentals at the global level of migration and displacement, you'd be going to chapter two. We've crafted it in this way so that it can speak to a very wide audience. And I was saying to our um, colleagues in the breakfast this morning that we had a small little intimate event, that our readership is right the way through from the far right, right the way through to the far left say the Open Borders Foundation, because we want to be able to educate people on migration, which is a highly technical and often legally bound and normative uh, sphere of policy on the fundamentals, including around vulnerability, including around movement, including around high-skilled mobility and talent competition and so forth. What I thought I'd highlight here is really two issues that we've seen. This was a bit of a takeaway in chapter one, if you look at remittances, for example, 126 billion in 2000 was the estimate produced by the World Bank, and now it's 689. So over 20 years, we've seen many things, many fundamentals have not changed when it comes to migration. Remittances has. The other aspects are displacement. We've seen a very significant increase in displacement globally in 20 years. Now, we know that that is partly due to better counting. There's been incredible investments in different organisations with the support of donors and member states to be able to quantify those particular aspects. But we also know that there are actually very significant trend changes. So on the one hand, we've got uh, remittances, international remittances, completely outstripping official development assistance. And yet on the other hand, we've got this growing, growing cohort and populations, people all around the world who have been displaced internally within their own countries and also across borders. This is just a bit of a taster on chapter two, the global chapter. What we do here is we try and paint a global picture with the latest data and information so people can very quickly get an update on what is changing, what are the long-term trends, what are the major cohorts. We include in that IOM programmatic and operational data. We say very clearly that this is not global because of its very nature in terms of how it is produced and how it is collected and reported, but it still provides some very important insights. And what I'm talking about there is victims of human trafficking. IOM supports victims of human trafficking around the world. I'm talking about assisted voluntary return. We're talking about displacement tracking in different parts of the world. Obviously, displacement is not occurring everywhere, but it is occurring in certain parts of the world. And then we look at key themes. Again, so that anybody can dip into the report and get a very clear picture of what the changes are and what the current situation is. Chapter three is a unique chapter. It's a report within a report. Uh, I unfortunately keep expanding it and my small team um, groans a little bit, but we're very pleased and proud to be working with some of the best migration data specialists to be able to collaborate on some of the outputs here. This is a genuine value add because nobody else produces this and it's something that we're very keenly aware of in, in terms of a, the increasingly crowded space around migration research and analysis to ensure that we are what I call low cost, high impact because we work with a very small resource base and we want to deliver very impactful work. So here we're looking at the six UN regions and we do a lot of quantitative analysis with researchers from around the world and then we do narrative updates at the sub-regional level because, as we know, the UN regions are not really designed for migration, but sub-regions is where it becomes a lot more meaningful. We use data to show patterns. And the reason for this is because we do want you to cut and paste from the report. We do want you to be able to look very quickly and get a strong sense of the long-term trends and the current issues that are facing policy makers, facing media, students, researchers around the world. This one we've added in, which is about Europe on the left, migrants to Europe. The middle bar is migrants within Europe, so intra-regional migration and then migrants from Europe. And so you can get a very, very, this is 30 years worth of data too, it's UN data. 
you can get a very quick sense of the regional differences, and they are very significant. On the right is Latin America and the Caribbean, but we also cover Oceania and Africa and Asia and so on. Migration is not uniform. That's basically the answer to that question. We've added this new series, which is about po proportional population change over a decade. And I've pulled out two regions. On the left is Europe, and it shows that Europe, some countries in Europe are facing significant population decline. That is a atypical, that's the outlier. No other region looks like this. Most of the other regions look like the one on the left, Latin America and the Caribbean, except for Asia. And unfortunately, Asia has a big red bar going off to the left, and that is Syria. Uh, Syrian displacement has had a huge impact, as we know, on the country and on the population, with many Syrians hosted in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and other places such as Germany. We also use data to illustrate complexity. This particular output is on refugee data produced by UNHCR. And this one is showing that not only in, in Africa, not only are countries large origins of refugees, but at the same time, they are hosting significant populations. Now, this particular graph is not similar for any other region. Africa has particular uh, dimensions that are very challenging in regards to cross-border displacement. But there are echoes in other regions, such as Asia, where we do have countries that are both host and origin countries of refugees. We've put in for the first time a very small piece that is expanding. It's getting a lot of attention on did you know. What we're trying to do is we're trying to illustrate that even if you've been working on migration for a really long time, there are some things that can be very useful to make you think, critically think about your assumptions and the stereotypes or previous information that may be outdated. The one that always surprises people is that France is the sixth top receiving country of international remittances in the world, and Germany is ninth. I dug down into this for another presentation uh, in terms of what is going on there. Where is that money coming from to go into France? And it's actually about sort of the people that I work with and other people in Geneva. It's people who are living in uh, France, but they're working in Switzerland. So most of those international remittances are salaries. They're not personal transfers, which is what we see in other, other corridors, other locations. Germany, number nine. Again, it's coming from Switzerland, but it's in the north, and especially the, you know, Zurich and those regions. People are living in Germany, but they're working and commuting in Switzerland. Syria is another case. Uh, for those people who've been working on migration displacement for a long time, they will know this and they will feel this and they will have been doing briefing, you know, 10 years ago about Syria being the third largest host country of refugees, mainly Iraqis, of course, but now that has flipped tremendously and in ways that people hadn't anticipated. And unfortunately, the latest news from Syria is telling us that it's not getting any better. In fact, it's getting worse. Chapter five is our lead chapter for the thematic part of the report. We change the themes every two years from report to report to pick up on current uh, complex and emerging issues. And this chapter is really on the one hand looking at a perennial issue about migrants' contributions in origin and destination, looking at socio-cultural contributions, civic political contributions and economic contributions. But the latest news, the latest research, the latest information shows us that disruption and disinformation is not only ignoring migrants' contributions, but it's actively seeking to undermine those contributions. And there is the, the first kind of tranche of research is coming through in terms of really looking at the data, doing big data analysis on how some groups are utilising social media platforms to present dis and misinformation to erode uh, the contributions of migrants and to really undermine public confidence in migration. We're expanding this chapter in the next uh, World Migration Report as more research and analysis, empirically based and secondary analysis comes through. These are the other thematic chapters. I won't go through those, but I would encourage you to read them, interrogate them at your leisure. 
Uh, again, they are on some of the key issues that we're seeing come up around the world. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time in terms of uh, why we're doing this, what's happening, how are people using it, is it sitting on the shelves, as some people might say. Well, in fact, we don't print it, so it's not sitting on shelves. Is it sitting on a digital shelf somewhere? Or are people actually using the report and how are they using it? This is particularly important for us uh, as international civil servants because we do want to be providing robust and rigorous, um, uh, credible work that has impact. We're not really interested in just producing something that sits off on the side. So we do cover this very closely and I get weekly updates from my team on this. We're very pleased that the World Migration Report 2018, it was the first one in the new revised series, is now IOM's number one publication of all time. That number is a little bit higher. I think it's around 540,000 downloads uh, globally. It's used in media outlets. It's got very high rates of citations in the so-called scientific or white literature. It's increasingly being used for fact-checking, which is a real inspiration for us, to be honest, because we're seeing uh, you know, racist and xenophobic material coming out and the World Migration Report, it's the cut and paste that I really like, taking graphs, taking some of the data and putting it in to counter some of those uh, erroneous uh, depictions of migration. The way that we work is we ask ourselves what do readers want when they're looking at a reference report on migration? Is the report reliable? Is it credible? Can I trust that the contents are accurate? This is very important. And it's always been important, but it's particularly important now. The way that we achieve this is we focus on quality. We are low cost, high impact, because we need to be. Uh, the starting point is that it is IOM's responsibility and obligation to serve. To serve member states, to serve migrants, and to serve public. The public, including through creating a report that can enhance understanding globally of migration and migrants. We have very clear expectations to authors. We go through editorial review as well as expert peer review, which I'll talk about in a little moment. We do reject chapters if the quality is not high enough to safeguard the integrity of the report and the quality. We do protocol referencing, as you know, primary referencing rather than secondary sources wherever possible, and we do a full data checking process, which I've taken from my time inside government, which is incredibly important, but not necessarily a strength of the academic environment. And we really focus on readability and usability. It is synthesis analysis. This isn't literature reviews. This is an empirical research. This is drawing on the vast body of empirical research and secondary analysis that is produced in scientific communities as well as by people in what we call the gray literature, international organizations, think tanks, NGOs, CSOs, uh, the media, traditional media. And we bring it together in terms of trying to make sense of some of the key issues and the key data. This is a rather intimidating list. Um, I don't like to put it up like this too often because it intimidates me. Uh, the academic reviewers who do the full peer review, we are incredibly grateful to them for providing their expertise, their time, the willingness of the academic reviewers to work with us to safeguard quality is, can't be underestimated. It's very, very important. It's very important in terms of the final product, but it's also very important in ensuring that we are able to access the latest thinking and the latest research and analysis on specific issues that they are experts in. We ask people to review where they have a significant body of work, that they know deeply the topic. And the external co-authors, one of whom we'll hear from later, Kathleen Newland from Migration Policy Institute, wherever Kathleen is, who uh, worked with us on the global governance, there she is, global governance chapter. We work with people who are working in practice, who are applied researchers and also academics. And again, that is about making sure that we can produce the best report uh, possible within the time frame. The little green one at the top there is that we work with experts within IOM from around the world. There is no bias on seniority or title. You can be a P2 or a D2. It's what's in your head that counts. That's really important. 
because we want to be able to exploit that knowledge. If you've been working in the field on a particular issue, if you've been able to actually gather that knowledge, that expertise, we'll use it for the report to ensure again quality. Last slides coming up now. Available in multiple languages. We have French, Chinese, Arabic, and Russian underway. A lot of French is now online. Spanish and English is completely done. Uh, German, very interested, uh, the German officials are very interested in getting German done, including so that they can counter alt-right groups that work in German, they don't use UN languages, of course, to be able to counter some of the misinformation. And then Portuguese, Swahili, Urdu, there's a long list. We're very committed to looking at opportunities to translate the report into languages from developing countries and regions. So if you are an official who's working in Mozambique, you won't be using a UN language, you'll be working in Portuguese. You might be at the border, you might be dealing with uh, policy and legal issues, you might be working on humanitarian assistance, but you'll be working in Portuguese, so you need it in Portuguese. Digital first to digital only, we haven't printed, this is the first time we haven't printed the World Migration Report. This is about being efficient, but it's also understanding what, what is involved in terms of printing a report of this size. Uh, we've saved around one million pieces of paper, which is only for 4,000 hard copies globally. Most readers use the electronic version. So we recognise that we've saved money and we're also very keen to make sure that it's environmentally friendly as possible. And we use USBs when there's an ICT accessibility or connectivity issue, particularly in developing regions and countries like Sub-Saharan Africa, which is another reason why we do individual chapters uh, that are produced, so they're easier to download. Donors are super important to us. There's a lot of donor fatigue, and we're very, very grateful for the donors who support us. I will name them. The Swiss government has helped, and so has the German government in the production, the actual production of the report. They have supported us financially in that area. Canada and USA for IOM, and all of those IOM logos that you can see there are regional offices and IDF out, uh, IOM Development Fund, as well as the Migration Resource Allocation Committee, I only know it by its acronym, MIRAC, they have supported us in terms of translations, getting the translations done, getting it out there. But uh, I also understand, having worked as a government official and have previously, uh, when I was in the Australian government, supported a previous World Migration Report, I know how difficult it is to make the case for funding for a report like this. But it's critically important and we very much value the donor contributions that come through to support our work. And I'm really looking forward to questions. Thank you. Panelists, so thanks a lot, Mari. That was just great. And yeah, here, Michael, why don't you sit here? So, can I ask each of you? Um, so, uh, Mari McAuliffe, as you know, let me just again start by thanking my friends at the Danish government. We do a lot of stuff with Denmark, and it's it's not easy for us. I mean, to do anything without our friends and partners and sponsors. And so, Denmark's been such a great partner. So, I want to thank them personally as well. So we have Mari, who's the head of the Migration Policy Research Division at IOM. We have Michael Clemens, Director of Migration, Displacement, and Humanitarian Policy, and a senior fellow at CGD, the Center for Global Development. Uh, and Kathleen Newman, who's the co-founder and a senior fellow. New, New Lind. A New Lind, sorry, New Lind, excuse me, New Lind at the Migration Policy Institute. Thank you. So let me start. Can I ask you each, to, what was your biggest takeaway from the report for, for each of you. And let me start with you, Michael, and then and Kathleen, start with the two of you and then ask Mari to, to, as well. So what was your biggest takeaway? Yes, thank you. I, and you read all 500 pages, of course, right? <laughs> you didn't make it a Netflix night? <laughs> 497. The calendar. 497. Right. Um, I, I saw a cartoon of a meteorologist recently saying, 
That's the Republican weather forecast. Stay tuned for the Democratic weather forecast. Uh -oh. <laughs> the, the, this report is just the weather forecast. It, it takes a, a highly politicized issue. It, it, it becomes, uh, it, it should be the go-to place for basic facts. Uh, my takeaway from it uh, was, uh, was that one of its headline figures that really migration as, a, as an average global phenomenon uh, is not in any sort of, uh, of epic historic revolution uh, uh, spiking and changing the world. Uh, the number of, the fraction of the world that is a migrant living outside their country of birth has inched up from about 2.5% to about 3.5% during my entire lifetime. I'm 47. And uh, really the challenges of migration are, are highly, highly concentrated in time and, mm -hmm. and space. When when the number, the monthly number of asylum applications in, in Germany spikes by a factor of 15, mm -hmm. as happened in late 2015, when the number of apprehensions at the U.S. southern border uh, triples between 2015 and 2019, uh, when five million people flood out of Venezuela, uh, that's where the challenges arise, and that's where uh, we're missing uh, just a range of institutions to not just uh, handle those situations, but I would argue uh, actually uh, mm -hmm. prevent those situations. And maybe we can get into yeah, the yeah. discussion of that. Good. Kathleen, what, what was your biggest takeaway? I, I'd say that um, the, the biggest takeaway is the salience of this issue. I mean, we've seen it, you know, becoming, getting higher and higher and higher on the policy agenda. But now it is really dominant in, in so many countries and also within the international system. Migration has been the sort of stepchild of the UN system and the multilateral system generally, the one great global issue that didn't have a cooperative uh, set of agreements, arrangements of some form. And now it does. Um, in, in the end of 2018 saw the, the adoption of a global compact on migration, the first time that states all over the world have come together to negotiate line by line an agreement on international co uh, migration and have agreed to cooperate with each other to manage this issue in a way that's beneficial for migrants, beneficial for the host countries, for the countries of origin, um, and, and for international sort of peace and comity generally. And that is significant. I mean, it's a piece of paper, but it is a platform for cooperation. And uh, I think that is something that flows from the sense of crisis that developed over the last uh, few years, particularly um, the, the sort of crisis uh, in the Mediterranean. And I guess that's one more thing I'd like to point to, yeah. Dan, is that um, there's, a, there's a huge gap between the headlines and the reality of migration. And Michael pointed to the, the a very important fact of the imbalances, that you have these surges of migration that capture the headlines that uh, for a time, often for a very limited time. Um, and, but the reality is that migration goes on everywhere all the time, that refugees are hosted, 85% of refugees are hosted in poor countries, usually the country next door. Uh, we hear about the ones yeah. that cross the Mediterranean and try to get into Europe. Uh, we uh, hear you know, about these crises, but in fact, you know, the refugees these days tend to remain refugees for generations. Yeah. We don't have people leaving and then being able to go home. So steadily rising numbers, migrants and refugees mostly in adjacent countries, um, not necessarily in the, the countries that hit the headlines. Good, good. Okay. All right. What was your, okay, you spent, I don't know, two years toiling in the vineyards on this and wrote mm -hmm. 500 pages or read all yeah. 500 pages. What's your biggest takeaway from this report? It's very difficult when you are so immersed uh, in a project like this. Uh, so I would really sort of point to our media engagement and how we have been working with media outlets doing, you know, interviews and clarifying data, supporting them in, in their reporting. And uh, several have really kind of 
had sort of wow moments where they have said, so there's globally really what we're talking about is that migration can be managed, that most of it is safe, orderly and regular, but what we really do need to be focusing on is we do need to be focusing on those people who are extremely vulnerable, many of which have been displaced internally within countries yeah. because of conflict and violence or because of uh, disasters, including weather-related disasters, or across borders as refugees. But on the whole, migration has actually produced some really significant benefits for countries around the world that we often forget. And this is why most people really, the media especially, are very interested in the front part of the report with the key data and the key statistics, especially this table. I put it in as a bit of a throwaway, really, before we finish the report, but it's been picked up a lot, because it really highlights Two key things, as I mentioned, international remittances and the huge impact that migrants have globally yeah. in regards to development, especially, but other aspects, and also displacement. So on the one hand, we've got this great success mm -hmm. story, and on the other hand, we have an abject failure because the UN is working very closely, and we can talk about the UN network in a moment, to be able to support things like the Venezuelan outflows to support Syrian displacement, both internally within Syria and externally. But what we're seeing is there is a lot of fatigue, there's a lot of political posturing in regards to communities who really need assistance, and that is dwindling mm -hmm. at the geopolitical level. So those are, the, I think, the two big takeaways, takeaways, and they are the ones that we're getting reflected back okay. uh, from media and others. Do you all agree that this is gonna get bigger <clears throat> as a, an issue, I'm certainly it's a political science issue, but in terms of the numbers, I mean, if I look at this, one of the reasons I wanted to have it up there is if you compare it from 20 years ago, there was 150 million international migrants, and, we, and like I said, there's different terms for, and, and there's a whole, you know, right, so, so there, demo, demographically speaking, we have a growing population, you could, argue, so would you each agree that this is gonna, there's gonna be more, folks on the move or less folks on the move over the next 10 or 20 years? What do you think? Generally speaking, they're going to be more. And we've seen you know, over time that um, though international migrants are a relatively small port of, part of the global population, it has been growing. And it's, as Michael said, it, the percentage of world population grows slowly. You know, it's a little above the trend line of growth of world population yeah. generally. So just on the growth of world population, there are going to be more migrants. But it's also surpassing the, the growth of world population, you know, by maybe a percentage point a year. That represents a lot of people. You know, in the last 10 years, there are 50 million more international migrants uh, than, you know, in, in 2020 than there were in 2010. If you took all the international migrants in the world, it would be the sixth largest country in the world. Uh, so these numbers are huge, even though as a proportion of world population, they're small, and they are growing. So, okay, so just, just so we're clear about migrants, right? So that this includes if I'm a partner at Goldman Sachs, and I live in New York, and I get on a plane and move to London, mm -hmm. I'm in that number, right? Yep. According to the UN, an international yes. migrant is any person who lives outside the, the country, country of his or her birth okay. for one year. Or so more. that's one category. Another category is I am, um, I'm from Syria, and I move from one part of Syria to another because of a civil war. That's called an internally displaced person, right? Yep. Okay, and there's a lot of those, right? There's something like 45 million or something like that. Kathleen, how many... Maso menos, 45 million? Yeah, that's about right. Okay. As compared to about 275, 276 Two. million international So, markets. So IDPs don't have the same kind of international protections as a third category, which are refugees, right? So if I'm a refugee, if, I'm, if I leave Venezuela and I cross, now this is a little bit funny because I'm not sure that they're counting Venezuelans as technically as refugees, but let's use, okay, so let's use Syrians, a, a Syrians or Afghans, right? So. I'm an Afghan and I left in 1979. I moved to Iran or Pakistan. I'm technically a refugee. There are two international agreements um, that were set up in the Cold War and designed for sort of short-term stays outside the country on the assumption you were gonna go back at some point that the captive nations of Hungary or, or the Baltic states that at some point you know, the, these folks would be able to return. They, they never did, but right? So that's, that's what a refugee is, right? So refugees, you've crossed the boundary 
and you're classified, you, you enjoy certain international protections. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the, the definition of a refugee is, is technical and it's fairly narrow. I mean, you have to have, uh, be outside your country of origin, so not an right. IDP. Uh, you, and you have to have left for, uh, because of a well-founded fear of persecution on one of only five grounds. So if you've left because of fear of climate change, you're not technically a refugee. If you, you have to have left because of race, religion, nationality, um, membership of a particular social group, uh, or which one did I leave out? Race, religion, nationality. No, gender, uh, gender social is- Social group. Social group, yeah. Yeah. Membership of a particular social group, thank you. Um, and uh, so it, you know- It's narrow. It's narrow and, and governments sometimes take a very expansive view and beyond that, most of the world's refugees today are people who fled from war. Right. It's not in the convention, but states accept war right. refugees. Okay. Uh, but they can decide not to accept somebody who isn't covered by Okay, but so there's another category, and this is a little bit uh, ambiguous, is I live in the Northern Triangle. I live in Guatemala or Honduras, and I put my 14-year-old on a train a thousand miles across Mexico to show up at the American southern border. That's not necessarily, that may or may not be a refugee. It could be an asylum seeker. There's, some, there's an argument to be made that I'm, seek, I'm leaving Guatemala or I'm leaving Honduras because my 14 year old is going to be recruited into a gang. And so I have credible fear, right? So there's, a, there's some discussion about that. And so they're all, that's also in this number, right? That this is, that they're, they're not necessarily a refugee. They're not an IDP. They're not the Goldman Sachs partner who's going from, right, from New York to London, but this, well, I don't know, irregular migrants, is that a way to describe well, it, Kathleen? Well, they're for sure international migrants, because yes, they've left their right. country. Uh, if they're asylum seekers, they are hoping to be recognized as refugees. Right. Now, you don't have to be recognized to be a refugee. If you've left your country on one of the five mm -hmm. grounds, you are a refugee, whether anybody acknowledges it or not. But some of those categories are ambiguous, and particularly this category, a particular social group. So the mother could argue, my child is a member of a particular social group that's likely to yeah. be recruited by gangs forcibly. And sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't in terms of being recognized as a refugee. Another one is, just one last one, I just, like I said, I think this is complicated and there's lots of subcategories for this. And so when we use these terms, I think it's important that we, we kind of just double click a little bit on each one. So there is also economic migrants. And so gold, the Goldman Sachs example is a form of an economic migrant or somebody who's going to go study and get an MBA at Harvard Business School in some ways is technically an economic migrant. But then you have other or folks who are going to go work from, move from Ukraine to San Francisco to work at Google is technically an economic migrant, I think is a fair way to right? And then you have other economic migrants who say, well, I'm going to move from a poor country to a middle income or a wealthy country and I'm going to do manual labor of some kind, or I'm going to, right? That's, a, that's also another form of economic migrant, right? And a lot of the people who leaving Venezuela are economic migrants, you know. They are forced migrants. And this is a category that's, you know, that's ambiguous, that nobody, it doesn't have a legal definition. But if you're forced to leave your home because you cannot make a living, because you cannot get medical mm. care, um, you're a forced migrant, but you're not necessarily recognized okay. as a refugee. All right, so, so now that I've, I've gone through all this, let me ask, I suspect this is an audience of true believers, that I suspect most of the folks here you know, know the issues, care about these issues. Uh, this was an easy sell to get, get the, this is the right, I mean, I, this is an easy sell of a, of, a, of a meeting. We had a really big turnout. I think people are very interesting. But I think there's a lot of folks, both in Washington and in places like the United Kingdom or Germany or France or other countries, well, OECD countries, but also non-OECD countries, that are skeptical about this discussion. So I'd like to ask each of you to make an argument for skeptical audiences about why they should care about this. And if the argument is, it can't be, you're, you're, you're listening to fake news and you can't be an argument that says, you, whatever your fears are, are stupid. So they can't be one of those two arguments. So what, are, what is your, for, for skeptical audiences, let me start with you, Michael Clemens, what is your argument to someone who would say, like, why should I take more refugees? Why should I, why should my country, my country is full up. This is the argument. My country is full up. We have plenty of people. 
And so I don't think this argument's gonna work with this, this group. I, I think I know my audience. So this, I'm not looking to, to convince anyone in this audience. But mm -hmm. I think there's a, this is a vote moving issue. And this is a vote moving issue. And if we just say they're stupid, or they're operating on irrational fears, or they're just getting fake news, I don't think that's an argument. So, so I'd like each of you to give me, give me a better argument. So let me start with you, Michael. The, their fears are not irrational. The, okay. It's not in anybody's interest that uh, a million people be showing up and apprehended at the, at the US southern border. That's not the best way for life to happen for those people, their families, for the US, certainly not for the Northern Triangle. It's not in anybody's interest right. that there'd be a vast spike of asylum seekers in, in Germany. I, I think the, the, the discussion of more versus less is one of the just completely useless blind alleys down which this discussion often turns. Uh, migration can be, can be bad or good depending on the, the policies that shape it. Uh, and I, here I want to give an example of, uh, of a, a really inspiring example that also shows what, how, how things can go wrong, which is uh, how, how the Eisenhower administration uh, and the rest of the world addressed the 1956 uh, Hungarian refugee crisis. Huge, highly concentrated uh, spike in flows of people, desperate mm -hmm. people, 200,000 people almost into Austria over the space of a few months. Wow. Uh, there were two paths in front of the world at that moment. It could have been uh, 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 keep those people in a concentration camp. Uh, th they were 3% of the population of Austria, so much, much larger than the 2015 spike to Germany. Austria was much poorer than Germany is now. Austria was still destroyed by war at that time. Uh, absolutely bad for Austria, for, 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 for those people. Uh, what they did instead was immediately bring together a coalition of 37 countries under the predecessor of the IOM and other organizations to resettle those people. And I'm, I'm, when I say 37 countries, I mean some of them went to mm -hmm. Colombia, Paraguay, New Zealand. They went all over the place. 40,000 of them came here. 40,000 more went to very Canada. successful. Uh, Stephen Udvarhazy, who built that museum out by Dulles, was one of them. He came as a high school kid. He pioneered aircraft leasing, added massive value to the U.S. economy, created all kinds of jobs. You never would have known that at the time. Politicians could have made hay by portraying those people as potentially violent, lots of them Communist Party mm -hmm. members, lots of them Jews. I don't know about that. Right. Uh, they chose not to. And it's the fact that they chose not to, to that made them beneficial. They could have been a burden. They could have been a huge. Uh, same uh, with you see it with Vietnamese boat people, and 100%. same with uh, Cuba or Cuban Cuban Americans, right? So you could argue. So they as a Republican, turned right, into a problem, right? So you know. So I would say, if as a Republican, I would say, all right, well, we uh, we don't like communism, and so this is a way of virtue signaling and saying we're being generous and we're taking on we're taking refugees from an, from an illicit or an evil regime, right? Isn't that, isn't yep. that part of it? Absolutely. Okay. And that was part of the coalition, was that it was a Cold War coalition. Yep. Uh, but the, the, the thing is, they were massively beneficial, and they were massively beneficial because of the coalition. They weren't automatically beneficial. Udvar Kazi could have been a burden to Austria in a concentration camp if we had decided to make him that. Right. Thank you. Kathleen. Yeah, I think a lot of the sort of counter arguments that you hear uh, about uh, addressed to people who are skeptical about migration or the sort of eat your vegetables argument. You know, this immigration is good for you. It's, um, you know, it's economically beneficial. Uh, the, the great global cities are the most successful sort of hotspots of innovation and growth. Uh, those cities that, that are built on immigration and accept immigrants. Um, cultural diversity is fun and so on. Those arguments are not very convincing no. to people who are um, who are skeptical, and so I think I think the appeal is is much more on a, a sort of human basis. Look, these are people. You know, put yourself in their place. You try to put a face on these sort of flows and influxes and so on. And um, I think uh, people in many countries, but I think it's particularly true that there's a mm. very strong humanitarian impulse yeah. in, in, or a religious uh, in this impulse. country. Much of it is founded on, on the, the fact that, that so many people in this country are people of faith. I also think it's sort of part of the national identity and something that people can be proud of, um, that you know, our ancestors, almost all of us have immigrant ancestors, and we're proud of them. Uh, and 
uh, this, this is a continuity in who we are as a nation. And I, I think um, that an, n we need to counter not just the sort of anti-immigrant rhetoric, but also this idea that we need to be much more selective. We need to, we need to select people who are educated and have um, higher degrees and have job experience mm. and have capital that they can invest in this country. I just don't think government is smart enough to be able to do that. Would they have picked four-year-old Sergio Brin, a Russian refugee uh, who has founded one of the largest and most powerful and most profitable countries in this country? Would they have picked founded Andy? Founded Google, the founder, founded, one of the co-founders of Google. One of the co-founders of Google, thank you. Uh, would they have picked uh, Udvar Hazy? Udvar Hazy or Andy Grove, the founder of Intel, who similarly was a, a monoglot teenager when he came to or the Madeline United Albright. States? Or Madeline Albright. Or Madeline You know, we don't know who the geniuses of the next generation are going to be, and we've done incredibly well by looking at people as people, allowing them to bring up their families here, and um, we've done very well out of that. And on the other side, could they have known that my German great-great-grandfather, who was a poor farmer from Germany, would have harmed the U.S. as much as me? <laughs> right. Could, could they have made that calculation Thanks, in advance? Michael. Well, no. Yeah. Great. So I think there's, you know, I think that this whole idea of managing migration according to some strict criteria is, um, is, is just not a doesn't give you a good perspective on what really is of long-term benefit to the country. So, so Mari, what's, what's your answer to this? I've got kind of a two-part uh, response, very similar to both Michael and uh, Kathleen as I was scribbling away my, my notes. Uh, the first one, and I have the opportunity to travel around the world into different geographies, go to different places, and I always find uh, unlike previous career, um, such as you want to kill a conversation, you talk about trade union regulation. What are you working on? Oh, trade wow. union regulation. Yeah, okay. So, but if you want to really uh, get into very interesting conversations all around the world, you'd say you work on migration. Immediately, people connect. And the way that they connect is first and foremost, let me tell you about my grandfather who was blah, blah, we've just done it here, who was displaced you know, from Europe, X, Y, Z, so on and so forth. It can I come across people who are very stridently anti-migrant? And then I ask them about their histories because then they say, oh yes, actually my uncle X, Y, Z or my friend or this person, uh, they've come from such and such. I said, well, they're a migrant. I said, no, they're not. They're not a migrant. There's an exception for the people that you know. So your discussion earlier about the categories is really important, even though it sounds a bit technical and nerdish, because when we really think about who is an international migrant, and you can be, have been a previous migrant and then gone back and returned after many years away, for example, you have a migration experience. You might not be in the stats. There's not six degrees of separation on migration and displacement. It's much closer. So when you start to talk about people with people, you know, in airports, which is usually where I engage yeah. with people who are very anti-migrant, then you start to actually explore with them that in fact they're not anti-migrant, that they have been listening to politics, that they have been engaging with misinformation. And this I find is a really interesting dimension. It came up earlier today in terms of the emotional response in regards to migration. But then we have to try, and the challenge is to marry that with the technical and the knowledge and the scientific work that is done on migration. That's, a ch that's our challenge. That's what we have to be working on. The second part of the response is flipping things a little bit and really knowing for a long time we have understood that peace and security and prosperity are drivers of stability and safe and regular and orderly forms of migration. Peace and security and prosperity are not drivers of displacement. They're not drivers of irregular and unsafe migration. This is particularly important and, and certainly a range of different actors, state actors and non-state actors are starting to understand that. We see that with the Sahel plant, for example, that has been set up very recently within the UN because we know that there is displacement, internal cross-border displacement. We know the causes of that. We know that there's irregular migration. 
there is a lot of instability. So we need to be looking at the drivers of security, of peace, of prosperity, mm -hmm. in which the world has been, if you look at it globally, remarkably successful overall. But it's some geographies and some areas that need our help that need our support to try and flip that. We always hear about the drivers of migration and they're usually in the negative. We need to be thinking about the drivers of stability, security. Good, Good. let's talk about that. So as I said earlier, I'm, in the, uh, I'm a disciple of Michael Clemens on this issue of $8,000 per capita, <laughs> right? This was, your, this was your research, right? So th this was at the Center for Global Development. There were two components to it that said that this is, I'm going to put words in Michael's mouth, but on the, you get to $8,000, there's a maso menos, and you don't hold it as $8,000 and a penny, that's when it happens, right? Let's, but maso menos in that zip code, when you hit, a country hits $8,000 per capita, and we can quibble about this, you see a market reduction, you hit, this is the migration hump, the, you hit the migration hump. Now on the way up, you have a lot more means and capacities and ability to migrate, right? So that's the other component is, okay, well, we're not gonna, you know, so my answer is, how can we get as fast as humanly possible to $8,000 per capita? That seems to me, that's an interesting question. Like, we don't have in this country, I think Panama and Costa Rica are above $8,000 per capita. We don't have folks crossing America's southern border from Panama or Costa Rica. Um, we, Mexico hit $8,000 per capita in 2005. There's a net migration from Mexico to the United States since 2005. Even with the violence in Mexico, they're still going back. Now, some of that's also a function of demography. So some of this is also demographic. You've had, I think you hit at two, basically hit replacement levels in places like Mexico. Though in the Northern Triangle, I think you have the Northern Triangle of Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. They're above replacement level, particularly in Guatemala, um, though the other countries are coming close to replacement levels. So if you have addition, surplus people, if I can describe it that way, and that's not really the right way to describe it, if you have a lot of fo uh, young people, there's going to be a proclivity to migrate, especially if you're not $8,000 per capita. So I want to talk about solutions, and I want to talk about this issue of stability and prosperity. So I want you each to talk to me about what do, if I can describe it as solutions, how do, we, how do we get to a higher level of prosperity and stability? And what is the role of institutions, think about, are there roles for institutions like the Inter-American Development Bank? Or roles like for Asian Development Bank, or the World Bank, or for AID? Um, because I, we did this big report, we visited 10 countries, we probably interviewed 300 people, and my deepest thought, after having done all this work, was that we probably needed something like, this is in American terms, we needed something like 20 planned Columbias over a 20 year period to focus on sort of the 20 global export, exporters of people countries. And then another 10 planned Columbias for the global sponge countries, the global shock absorber countries. I mean countries like Uganda, which has one of the most generous recipient uh, programs, right? Or help support Columbia, who's now taken on at least a million folks. So that was my deepest thought, was that we're going to need a combination of trade, development, diplomacy, security, and attention. Uh, now, and some of these problems with countries that people are leaving are super intractable. I don't have a clever, pithy answer for Syria, but I think there's a series of other countries of sort of the 20 global export countries where there's, there's some economic and political changes you could make over time that you could over a 10 or 15 year period actually bend the curve and, and make changes happen. So I think we could actually, if we were sitting in this room 20 years ago and we talked about HIV AIDS, and I'm not comparing people to a disease, okay? So I don't want anyone walking out of here saying, Dan is comparing, <laughs> okay? But if we'd had this conversation 20 years ago, we said HIV is in, an intractable problem. It's not a manageable problem. We got a co global coalition of the willing together and we've spent collectively 10 or $12 billion a year and a lot of political capital and diplomacy in over 20 years, we've, and we've innovated, and we've bent the curve on HIV AIDS. Uh, there have been other things like that, whether it's polio or whether it's, or Colombia, just Colombia as a country. If we'd, had, we'd sat in this room 20 years ago, we'd have said Colombia's on the verge of becoming a narco state, the FARC is at the gate, they could win and take over as a Marxist narco uh, uh, guerrilla group taking over the country. That, that's the conversation that we had in the late 90s. 
So there was a coalition of partners that came together and bent the curve and changed the, changed the trajectory of, of Colombia. We don't talk about that. Colombia is now receiving a million people. So I would posit that this challenge of what we call irregular migration is a manageable challenge with political leadership uh, over, but it's a 20 year challenge. So you agree, you all agree with that? Disagree with that? So let me start with you, Michael Clements. A hundred percent, and I want to tie this back to what you said, uh, you, you were uh, asking earlier about will migration go up or, mm. or down. Uh, th there's really a, a very high risk that crisis migration increase in the, in the mm -hmm. future. There's no uh, feasible mechanism for, for uh, uh, migration in response to climate change, which will often be experienced as natural disasters, which doesn't fit under anybody's uh, uh, the legal definition of forced migrants. Uh, if, if ethnic violence were to spiral out of control in India, uh, if Libya were to completely collapse, uh, there, there could just be enormous crises. Mm -hmm. uh, an entirely different uh, genre of migration, just uh, economic and demographic pressure for migration, uh, comes in waves, as you pointed out. Uh, the, the reason people left uh, Italy and Sweden in the late 19th century was not because they were collapsing into poverty. It was a response to economic mm -hmm. development in those countries. Same reason why a wave of people left Korea in the 70s, same reason why a, a wave of people left Mexico in the 80s and 90s that, as you pointed out, has now ended. We're in the middle of that right now in the Northern Triangle of Central America. Those three countries are in that five to $10,000 window that you talked about. There's a whole lot of countries in Africa that are below it, uh, and that's why uh, the- The uh, big show's Africa. A hundred percent. There will be a net increase in the labor force of South <coughs> Africa of 800 million people 800 million people, that's several times the entire labor force yes. of the United States is the net increase in the labor force of Sub-Saharan Africa by 2050. Uh, that's where migration pressure is going to be. However, even that will subside. And when you asked uh, about uh, yeah. the, the, the window of time, uh, the number of, uh, of, uh, of uh, youths entering the labor force in, uh, in El Salvador uh, 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 stopped growing three years ago and is now negative. That, that is, the, the, the number of youths in El Salvador is now shrinking year on year. The yeah. UN predicts it will shrink uh, for the foreseeable future. The same thing is going to happen in Honduras five years from now. Uh, it will hit almost zero uh, in Guatemala ten years from now. Uh, th that is, the demographic mechanism is one of many mechanisms that brings countries over that hump and there's going to be decreased pressure. In Africa, it's just it's just, just the right. beginning. And I just want to mention, you asked about solutions before I shut yeah, up. Yeah. Uh, th uh, I don't think there, there is a absolutely any easy solution to that. New destinations for migration have to be part of it because they're definitely not all going to Europe. Uh, however, there are many, many, many missing institutions that could make that work better. And one that is, uh, that is in the Global Compact for Migration that is now being piloted, I'm delighted to say, uh, between Belgium and Northern Africa. And I, the idea are called Global Skill Partnerships, which is bilateral agreements between destination and origin countries to train migrants up in immediately needed skills and place them in employers. The training happens before migration, so they arrive with the skills to immediately, visibly contribute, integrate immediately. Uh, migration happening on vastly better terms than, uh, than these uh, spikes of irregular migration, which, as, as I pointed out, can be created by policy, are not in anybody's interest, uh, 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 truly uh, reflect the worst fears of skeptics, but are not inevitable. They can be shaped by policy. Thank you. Okay, Kathleen, what do you think? Well, I think there, um, there are a lot of very promising trajectories in economic terms. I mean, Bangladesh once thought of as you know, one of the basket cases of, of the developing world is about to move from low income into low middle income status. I mean, this is, you know, that's It's remarkable. an accomplishment, it's remarkable. It's a remarkable accomplishment. However, what I would say is that it's not just about income and demography. I think it's also very much about hope. You know, do people who live in a, in a certain country have hope that their future is gonna be better than their present? And that a lot of that is about being able to get a job, earn an income, and so on. But it's also about things like infrastructure. Uh, above all, good governance. You know, if corruption is rampant, if people feel that no matter how hard they work and how talented they are, that they cannot get ahead because they don't have the right connections, they're gonna to try to leave. Um, and if you look at the very few studies, which in my institute we've tried to um, 
a mass on aid effectiveness, on the impact of aid on migration. The only place where you can really point to an impact of aid on migration is aid for good governance. Mm. Um, and again, you know, it's not strong evidence, but uh, it's stronger than for any other kind of aid. Um, the World Bank just suppressed, and then I think has finally published a study that looked at the arrival of aid and the incidence of capital flight out of the country, yes, saw, finding yeah. a very strong correlation. So, you know. Awkward. Awkward, awkward right? to say the uh, least. But aid for good governance, for fair elections, for you know, anti-corruption efforts, uh, for transparency, does at least seem to give people hope. And I think it's, you know, you still have migration out of some pretty rich countries because of political repression and corruption and um, a general sense of unfairness. You have backsliding, tragic backsliding in countries like South Africa. Um, so this, I think, we can't look just at income, but have to look at that broader context. Okay. All right. So, but, so if you were the head of the World Bank or the head of the IDB, more on anti-corruption, more on good governance. Michael, what would you, if you, if you were the head of, if you were an executive director at the, one of the regional development banks, what would you be advocating for in terms of spending money on? There's just so much that's missing for, for migration to be more uh, uh, mutually beneficial and visibly, tangibly mutually beneficial. And I, uh, certainly uh, 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 bilateral agreements to uh, ensure that migrants arrive with skills, language, and technical skills, and, and aid agencies absolutely have to be part of that because there's no other agency of any government yeah. that, that has the, the capacity or the. So it could be a, this is AID. Is. This is a responsibility for AID. This is a responsibility for the development bank, multilateral development banks. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and, and not just uh, uh, the, the, uh, imparting skills, but in, in okay. fostering links for for temporary low skill migration as well. Uh, the the access to the uh, to the main. Uh, low-skill work visa of the U.S., the H-2 visa in, in Honduras, is 1 20th per capita of what it is in Mexico. Uh, there's no legal or economic or fundamental reason why, why, why irregular flows from Honduras couldn't be substituted by regular flows that, uh, that are directly mutually beneficial, that are linked directly to an employer, and that's what happens in the H-2 program. Uh, but it's just not a priority of, 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 of governments to make the, those linkages or to, uh, to, to foster the connections to U.S. employers that, okay. would, have, that, that, would, that, would, that would make that happen. Okay. Uh, aid agencies are, 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 uh, uh, don't see that, that as their job right now. Most people at, at USAID, uh, God love them, they're wonderful people, uh, fundamentally see their job as, as stanching migration, as, as developing other countries like the, the, Responding the, to the emergency. Uh, Responding to the emergency, giving people reasons not to leave, the, the, the last thing they, they see themselves doing is, is fostering migration, fostering links. Uh, however, uh, th there, are, there are models for that. Uh, the, the German aid, aid agency, GIZ, has been involved in, in programs to upskill migrants before they come to Europe. Okay. Uh, that is the opposite of trying to stanch migration, is actually making it work uh, better for everyone, and that's a long-term investment. Okay. So, Mari? Very, very quickly, uh, we do do analysis in the World Migration Report looking at uh, correlations between different indexes, for example, uh, countries along the Human Development Index kind of path, as well as, say, Transparency International, Risk Matrixes, as well as the Henley Visa Index. And we did this in Chapter 7 of the 2018 report to show the very strong correlations, again, between peace and prosperity and security means high mobility. If you are from a country that is a fragile state or that uh, suffers in terms of displacement, uh, in terms of uh, fragility, as I mentioned, Transparency International runs the Corruption Index, for example, you are going to have much more difficulty accessing regular pathways, which the Henley Visa Index shows very, very clearly, which means you have very limited options in regards to pathways. Uh, irregular migration, asylum seeking, that's pretty much it, because you won't be able to access the mobility regimes that we are able to access uh, in wealthier countries that have peace and security and stability. So we do that through different reports. We've got um, a chapter, chapter 10, which is looking at migrants in countries in crises. Again, we've used the Human Development Index because it incorporates uh, economic 
uh, this variables. This is the UN Human Development Index. Yeah, the Human yeah. Development Index UNDP. that produced for, by UNDP, and for a long time, it's uh, one of the most widely respected and, and used uh, indexes. But it also covers things like education, uh, health, uh, literacy, and so forth. So we use that as, a, as kind of like a more well-rounded uh, index to be able to look at migration and the different manifestations from migration, especially from a migrant's perspective. If you are in Quetta, Pakistan, but you're an Afghan, you might be a Hazara, for example, you have extremely limited options. That's because of your country of birth and the passport that you hold. It's not related to your potential. So we have to be really, really mindful of that. We try and do that at the macro level. We'll mm -hmm. be doing more in the next report looking at this, trying to marry the kind of like the big uh, macro level, mm. but trying to make it uh, relevant for how migrants think about mobility and movement and displacement. Of course, that Hazara who's sitting at the bus stop in Quetta has been displaced from Afghanistan, right? The other thing that I would point to, uh, and I don't want to be overly dramatic at all, um, we've tried to treat it very carefully in chapter one, the overview chapter, and we've talked about this era of increasing uncertainty, is that we cannot take our privileged positions in regards to peace and security and economic development for granted. We're seeing that there is an erosion of democratic institutions globally, and we need to be mindful of history, exactly as we have been talking about today, especially Michael's comments, in regards to where we've come from and, and how we need to safeguard that. Now that, I think, is something that is foremost in, in our minds, as we have studied history and we know how the Bretton Woods system has developed, how the human rights framework has developed, the League of Nations and the United Nations. But I'm educating my children about that because they are the ones that are more likely to be taking it for granted. We need to be doing more work on valuing and quantifying peace and security and stability. Great, okay. Um, this is excellent, thank you. Let's, let's go to Q&A. There's a lot of thoughtful people here. So I wanna see hands and I'll pick three people and we'll do a couple rounds. Okay, uh, this gentleman here, this woman here, and this gentleman here. Okay. Just stand and say your name. Yeah. Uh, Richard Colvin. And can you get extra credit if you keep your comment short? So, uh, so okay. name, organization, comment or question short. Thank you. Okay, Richard Coleman, uh, CBP, retired. Uh, the fear factor of that's been whipped up in the United States. I think of the Scaravan, the women and children. Oh my God, and we're moving eight miles a day. What will we do? Okay. Uh, the Syrians, the Washington posted a story that the Syrian refugees were the most vetted group in the history of the planet, mm -hmm. anytime, any place. 20 different steps. Okay, it so what's your years. question? All right, I think the real fear though is that these people are gonna vote Democrat. So okay. how do we accommodate that? How do we handle that? Okay, <laughs> this woman here, the behind, behind you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my name is Louisa Marin. I would like to know if you agree with the following statement. Um, the, the Cartagena uh, Convention of 1984, boy, uh, um, you said that, enlarge the reasons why a person can, can be taken as a refugee. So I would like to know if that is being taken uh, into consideration, especially for countries as Venezuela. And also another, another thought is, don't you think that um, the international law about migration should be reinstated? You, we need to update that because the, the, res the drivers of migration are changing. Are you from Colombia or Venezuela? I am from Colombia. Okay, great, excellent. Colombia is being very generous. How many how many Venezuelans are living in Colombia right now? Uh, there, there is one million six hundred thousand Venezuelans in Colombia. Venezuelans right now. in Colombia. Thank you. A little bit okay, more. Thank right you very now. much. Uh, my name is Juan Gutierrez. I'm a consultant on topics of international migration for different organizations. My question is uh, skills. How do we make use of them, especially in contexts like refugees, especially in contexts as, I think it was very nicely placed, uh, the idea of how to match skills with the power of your passport and the opportunities that you get, because that brings me back to displaced, emplaced people. 
people who cannot live where they are or are trapped where they are, but they're displaced. They, they want to leave, they want to run away, but they can't. Um, and one last question. Can you give an example of that? What's a displaced, what's an example? Displaced in place? Yeah, who's, a, who's um, someone like that? People who are so poor that they cannot even afford to run away for their lives. Okay. Um, countries torn by violence, but it could also be even Venezuela, people who are trapped there because they don't have the moves. Or because they the, have a the sick relative move. or something. For example. Okay, fine. Okay. And uh, f one final quick question. Um, we all know about people running away from sudden onset climate change events, hurricanes, disasters, sure. earthquakes, what all. But a lot of the uh, slow onset climate change events generate problems that are classified as economic migrants. Is there anything in the upcoming reviews of migration in institutions in the report mm -hmm. or anything that looks at that? Okay. That's it, thank you very much. Thank you, a lot of good, interesting questions. Okay, Michael, let's start with you. Take any or all. Very, very briefly, all. Uh, one thing that strikes me about migration policy is how the, uh, uh, it is often construed as a response to a phenomenon that it is actually going back to cause. And you know, if, if, uh, if a political movement that gets behind the claim that uh, you know, Mexican migrants are rapists, and some of them, I suppose, are good people, is surprised about Hispanics' voting preferences in the future, which, which could be quite accurate, what you mm -hmm. say. Uh, maybe there's room for thinking about the degree to which the, the, those preferences are the result of policy r rather than the, the, the cause of policy. Um, and and uh, about the Cartagena Declaration, uh, I mentioned the missing institutions in the world. The, the Cartagena Declaration is, an, is, a, is a really visionary example. What was the Cartagena Declaration for, for our television audience? So uh, I, real experts uh, could correct me on this, but I, I don't think that it actually formally changed the definition of refugee, but it, it, it declared that within Latin America, people moving due to generalized violence, even if they don't uh, uh, face a specific threat against it, themselves or a social group they belong to, will be given uh, roughly the same treatment as people who are legally refugees. If, that, if that's, uh, that, that, I, I hope that's a, a, a mostly accurate statement. It is a, uh, in the rest of the world, there is no formal declaration of how people fleeing generalized violence uh, will be treated, much less other forms of survival migration, like climate migration or, or due to economic collapses, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's really an example of, uh, of, uh, of, of people stepping in to fill a, a great void. And the, uh, the, the, the really visionary policies of, of Colombia in this current crisis, which again, uh, other leaders other than Santos and Duque could very well, I, I lived in Colombia for a little while, there, there is a certain brotherhood with Venezuela. Well, they also owed, a, the, the Colombians kind of were owed one, right? Because the Colombians during the war were in Venezuela for 20 years, so the Venezuela, they, and the Venezuelans were sort of owed one, right, by the Colombians. Is that a way to describe it? Uh, uh, there, is, there is absolutely some historical linkages and brotherhood. There is yeah, also yeah. a natural xenophobia and, and lots of uh, jokes about uh, Venezuelans. Yeah. And uh, certainly there, are, there were feelings in the population that, that populists could have used for political advantage to demonize them and uh, I, uh, the, the economic evidence that's coming out from uh, Denny Bahar at, at Brookings and others is, is, is really vindicating, I, I think, the, those policies uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, really lack a, a, a a, a, a legal framework in the rest of the world. Mm. Um, I, I, I thank you for highlighting the role of skills. You know, uh, I, I'm, I'm an economist. I, I look through at things through a certain lens. Uh, I, I think in the whole uh, negotiation process of the Global Compact on Migration and, and for the next several decades, there's a, a major disconnect in the world of, of regulating economic migration. And in the broadest possible strokes, it's fundamentally that most destination countries don't want low-skill migrants. And uh, most origin countries don't want high-skilled migrants because they see it as losing a resource. And so there isn't a global constituency for low or high skill or any kind of migration. And that, that's why I think it's so important for there to be institutional innovation on skills. I highlighted this concept of global skill partnerships, which is to work with countries of origin in partnership with them, not predatory on them, but working with them to train migrants for migration so that the people who are benefiting from those skills at the destination are the ones who are directly involved in forming the skills and not taking anything away actually adding to the stock of skills in the world and using migration as, a, as an engine to create skill uh, as an example of, of, a, of 150 different institutions uh, around skills that are, that are needed to make migration work better. Great, Kathleen? 
Thank you. Three, three great questions. Um, I, I think on the, on the first one, I, I don't think uh, migration policy is so much shaped by fears that immigrants will vote for the other party. They won't be able to vote at all for quite some time uh, to begin with. And the way our immigration system is functioning, it takes so long now to acquire citizenship and to just process the paperwork that that's not a that's, that's probably not a fear that's in the time frame of most politicians. However, uh, as, as Michael hinted at, I think when you have a nativist populist movement, that uh, anti-immigrant sentiment is just one of the pillars of that, appealing to people who fear change, uh, sometimes for good reasons and, and sometimes for reasons that are not well-founded in, in evidence. But the fear is real, and politicians have proven themselves very adept at, uh, at, at playing on those fears. That's a, a bedrock of, of nativist uh, populist movements. Um, on the Cartagena Convention, uh, I think it's, um, I mean, it's, it's the, the Cartagena Convention, which expands the refugee definition beyond those five grounds I mentioned earlier, including uh, generalized violence or events disturbing public order, uh, is not itself legally binding, but it has been incorporated into the domestic law of many countries in, uh, in South and, and Central America. It originated in the Central American wars of the, in the 80s, of the 80s and, and into the 90s, and uh, has, has proven to be a, a really valuable sort of bedrock for, for policy. But the, the current um, remarkable uh, pattern in South America of response to the outflows of migrants and refugees from Venezuela is not so much built on Cartagena, although that's part of it, as on the sort of Mercosur residency arrangements and the freedom of movement within the Southern Cone and the other uh, uh, members of, of the uh, South American common market, uh, which have allowed people to move in to get to be able to work legally so you don't have refugee camps for Venezuelans. The contrast with Syria, I was in Bangladesh last week, the contrast with the Rohingya in Bangladesh who are strictly encamped, not allowed to work, not supposed to move out of the camps, not allowed to get education uh, in, uh, in, in the Bengali language. Um, so the, the, the contrast there has really been built on a pattern of regional cooperation and regional mobility, which um, would, would be extremely valuable <laughs> if, it were, uh, if it were imitated elsewhere. Um, for skills, how you promote this, I mean, Michael has, has written a great deal about this. I think um, skills recognition is one of the provisions, uh, one of the actions that's prescribed in the Global Compact for Migration, making skills recognition across countries easier would certainly allow uh, host countries to benefit more from the, the migrants that they get. Um, and, and finally, just sorry to be, to be so quick, but in terms of slow onset climate change, um, there is a whole lumbering process in uh, the Paris negotiations around loss and damage to countries from climate change, which would take in some of the, this erosion of uh, productive potential. But uh, in the, it's already happening. I mean, and many people are, are leaving the countryside, leaving agriculture because it's no, you have to put in more calories to raise a crop than you can get out of that crop. Um, and, the result of that, the, the, the immediate result of that is urbanization. You know, and, and it's often very difficult to tell the difference between internal displacement and urbanization in that kind of context. And so you have these enormous megacities. I mean, Dhaka, Bangladesh, I can tell you, is completely unmanageable. You know, it can take you an hour to get around a corner because there are so, there's just so many people 
moving around the city in so many different kinds of vehicles, and uh, the air quality is horrendous. Um, the challenge of these poor mega cities into which people are just entering from the countryside in very great numbers is, I think, the first, um, the first impact that we're seeing of slow onset uh, climate change. And there, there has to be a, a program of, uh, of a human settlements address to how to make these places livable. Uh, and they can be. I mean, we have highly functional megacities um, that absorb enormous numbers of migrants, New York City being one of them, <laughs> you know. Um, and uh, this can be an advantage, but there has to be infrastructure and there has to be, um, you know, economic activity to absorb those numbers. Okay. Okay, very Mari. quickly, um, I will probably zero in a little bit on the displaced in place question, which is a really a great one. I'm reminded of Jorgen Carling's seminal work a couple of decades ago, where he talked about the involuntary immobility that occurs because we know that those people who are most in need are not necessarily the ones who have the resources uh, to be able to move. So what I've been kind of struck by, I think, uh, over time and, and thinking about uh, the use of technology in labour relations. As I mentioned, I, my first sort of career was in, was in labour relations and areas of uh, freedom of association, jurisprudence and so forth, and looking at that domestically and also internationally. And the great uh, hope of technology to be able to be utilised for remote working purposes, for example, to be able to utilise skills and experience and expertise across the globe, given globalisation and transnational connectivity and so forth. And somehow, somewhere along the line, that has been sort of set aside. And I'd really like to you know, have a conversation and start to think about the tech solutions for those people who would be able to ben be able to benefit from uh, being able to work remotely in, in different ways and contribute in different ways that don't necessarily involve migration. Uh, we know that there are groups of people who are kind of locked into intergenerational migration who want to stay at home. They want to raise families at home. They want to be with their communities. But there have been strong corridors that have been developed where they feel enormous pressure to migrate. So I think there are some solutions that are really underutilised and underexplored in the tech sector. I extend that right the way across through the entire migration cycle and also uh, point to misinformation and disinformation and so on. Because we know that there are tech solutions. Part of the problem is in the use of new technology. That's where the solutions are going to be found. So it's an area that we've been working on increasingly, the interconnections between migration and technology right the way through the migration cycle, including narratives. And we'd be keen to start a conversation uh, with people here and elsewhere to look at some of those solutions that can be realised. We know that there are pockets of work that is going on. Certainly, for example, one example is the education of refugees using platforms, online platforms, to enhance accessibility for refugees who are displaced in camps and so forth. But we think there are other opportunities that can be realised too. Good. Okay. I've got time for a couple more. Okay. This woman here and this woman way back there. Okay. These two. Okay. This woman here. Hi, thank you. It was very interesting. I'm um, working at the Belgian Embassy, but I'm also doing research on um, the legal protection of climate migrants, if we could call it like that, because there isn't a definition. And I think like a legal protection comes from a, a serious definition. Um, my question is, which platform or, or on which platform would you say that it, that is necessary to take steps on that? Uh, is it international? Is it the United Nations? Or is it more regional? Is it the European Union? Or um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Okay, okay. The, other, the other one? Yes, please. Someone's got their phone on. I'm Turn sorry, that there might you go. be mine, which is <laughs> sitting in there. <laughs> Great. Um, okay. Well, this is You'll let that now. person know how appreciate that was. Great. 
Right, <laughs> ringing in place. I'm from the Embassy of Colombia, then, and it's now officially, as of December 31st, uh, 1 point, almost 8 million refugees. Wow. So, my question is like, of course, Colombians have been very generous with the Venezuelans, and we do have like an ethical imperative to receive them. But also, like later on, have been arising some sentiments of xenophobia that are very like challenging for our country. So, I my question is, if you you know an example of an effort or a campaign worldwide that has been successful in reverting the trend of xenophobic sentiments among the recipient communities. Good. Okay. Michael? Uh, can, can, okay, so how, how do we deal with, yeah, how do we? Yes, so uh, I, I want to uh, give a, a, a point of trivia that, uh, that, uh, I, with which I have surprised even people who know way more about the subject than, than I. Uh, until, uh, until 1980, uh, so for the first quarter century of the, the existence of a refugee definition in U.S. law, uh, that definition included people fleeing uh, uh, quote-unquote natural calamities. Uh, it was rarely uh, invoked. I, I tried to find uh, all, all the instances I could, and I, I could only find two uh, volcanic eruptions in the Azores where people would, were admitted specifically under that provision. Uh, it, it was revised in 1980 just to harmonize with the, with the, natural, uh, with the, the international definition. Uh, I, I highlighted just to point out that th this was something that the U.S. was doing unilaterally for almost uh, three decades. And there is, there's absolutely nothing to stop uh, even a single uh, a migrant destination country, not from uh, redefining uh, uh, refugees, which th 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 in the example I, I gave, but, but creating a, a, a different pathway to respond to this. Uh, de facto, Australia is doing this uh, now, uh, uh, explicitly, uh, at least in, uh, in, in rhetoric, taking account of, of climate change as a, as a way to utilize existing pathways. Uh, to me, uh, I don't see a... I have never seen a way of, of utilizing existing refugee law for that purpose in that it's designed to make you convince a consular officer that you're fleeing a violent persecution based on a well-defined social group that you belong to. to. Try to convince a consular officer that you're a climate migrant and there, there is no even hypothetical evidence you could bring to bear at the individual level. It's going to need to be a prima facie designation. It's going to need, that prima facie designation is going to need a, an objective criterion so that it can't be gamed. Uh, the, the only possible objective criteria I can imagine would come from remote sensing or statistical analysis of natural events. And uh, that means an institution to make those determinations needs to be set up. Absolutely nothing to stop a, a, a single migrant destination country from doing that unilaterally. And, and again, th this is in a nascent form, Australia is, is essentially doing this. There's nothing to stop Canada from doing it, nothing to stop uh, uh, the United States from doing it. So certainly also nothing to, to, to stop the, uh, the IOM and international agencies from, promote, from proposing international frameworks of this kind. Uh, and you know, th there are problems with it. Uh, how would you set the criteria? But I, I, if there is to be a, a formal way to address climate migration, I, I, I literally don't see an alternative to it. And it's certainly not the refugee convention. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let uh, okay. uh, experts address Colombia. Okay, Kathleen. Um. I mean, we do for the United States, and uh, in particular, um, does uh, create uh, refuge for some subsets of people affected by sudden onset climate through our temporary protected status um, designation. We've done it for you know hurricanes, for volcanoes, temporary. Montserrat. In, in it's quotation temporary. marks. Well, temporary, you know, has, can go on for 20 years and more. Um, but that system is now um, under pressure, to put it mildly, uh, from, the, from the current administration. And um, part, part of the reason is that it has proved very difficult to say to people, your crisis is over, you can go home now. And that's partly, that's been a, um, a tacit agreement between the country of origin government and our government. You know, the government of El Salvador has said, please don't send people back, we can't absorb them, and so many of our people are dependent on the remittances from those populations. So, you know, it's been, it's been a good way to mitigate the, the impact of not only of the disaster itself, but um, of 
of poverty uh, and lack of investment over time. However, it only has been applied to people who are already in the country at the time of the disaster. It has never admitted people as a result of disaster. And we have no system for, um, as we were discussing earlier, for slow onset uh, climate change ex except for uh, through our normal uh, visa channels like mainly family reunification or the beloved to me diversity visa, which uh, probably also will not exist for much longer. Um, on the question of uh, has there ever been a successful campaign to reduce xenophobia? Um, Murray is probably better uh, equipped to answer that question. I'm really not. I, I'm really not aware of one, but because I think these things are not so intentional as campaigns. You have waves of xenophobia. They come up and they do subside. You know, you had horrible xenophobia in this country in the 20s, uh, in the 50s, less extreme, but. Um, you know, they do come and go, and I think it's more through familiarity and uh, integration uh, that, that those feelings tend to subside, and also uh, through, um, I mean, they tend to arise in periods of either great economic insecurity or uh, rapid social change, which people scapegoat immigrants for. And so when, when, you know, when and if populations become more comfortable with the results of those changes and stop um, feeling so much under pressure, uh, the need to find a scapegoat dissipates. Um, but I'd be interested, I'm interested in hearing what Mari has well, to say about successful uh, campaigns. There's a lot of very interesting research that is being undertaken uh, at the moment as we speak on sort of public attitudes to migration, um, sort of more broadly and then in specific sort of like key, key areas. There's some great work that's being done out of Oxford at the moment and they have found through their kind of impact evaluation research that a combination of both the statistics as well as narratives and personal stories really does have uh, impact in making people kind of like rethink their sort of surface level responses, not necessarily the value positions that they're long held, but their immediate surface level responses such as, you know, xenophobic type of language and so forth, which is obviously, as Kathleen said, it can be very um, temporary, it can be cyclical, it can be related to uh, you know, hate speech or people who are being incited or sentiment driven uh, for political reasons and other reasons, uh, geopolitical reasons, transnational tribalism and so forth. So we know that to counter that, there are more effective ways than other ways. We also know too, increasingly, that there is an issue around timeliness and being able to get information delivered that does make you rethink. We've seen that in the kind of negative ways around Cambridge Analytica, for example, and the, you know, the, the Brexit kind of leave campaign and the conversion rates and so forth. But we know that the delivery mode is really through smartphones these days. So the challenge is to try and marry a number of different components uh, to, for delivery. There are a couple of uh, you know, genuine real examples such as IOM's I'm a Migrant campaign. That is a sort of a general kind of model and it would be very interesting to look at deploying these narrative stories into particular kind of communities to try and draw on history to, draw, to try and draw on narrative stories and try and break down some of those assumptions uh, and the negative assumptions around migrants. The other one, of course, that comes to mind is the UN Together campaign, which again was a platform base that looked at trying to get out into different communities and frame things in a, in a very positive way. So I think the challenge going forward is again to be able to utilise technology, but to also be able to draw on the latest research and analysis that can show us what is more effective in terms of different uh, content, if I can call it that, to be able to counter xenophobia okay. at Great. a particular point in time okay. and in a particular okay. cohort. Kathleen, last point. Yeah, just um, I think the one one thing that that um, that we have not been doing is um, countering the negative narratives, particularly spread on social media, in a very smart way. 
and in a very systematic way because the the anti uh, the xenophobic campaigns are very systematic and quite coordinated and um, the we've been doing research at MPI on uh, the insights of social psychology about how people form and change opinions and what appeals uh, are tend to be more effective, but that hasn't really been put into action very much. And I think it needs to be intentional, and I think it needs to be systematic, um, which hasn't happened yet. Great. Thanks very much. Please join me in thanking the panelists.